When you're asleep, ladies and gentlemen, you need your dreams. I'm here to tell you that when you're wide awake, you also need your dreams. You must have your goals. You'll never make it as a wandering generality. You must become a meaningful specific. If you're going to work tomorrow because that's what you did yesterday, you're not going to be as good tomorrow as you were yesterday because now you're two days older and no closer to the goal which you do not have. You can't make it as a wandering generality. A number of years ago, Larry Majors, my executive assistant, got a phone call from a lady in Birmingham, Alabama. At the end of the conversation, she said, Zig, she said, I believe this woman thinks she's got an impossible problem, but I believe you can solve that problem her, with her in just a few minutes if you will spend that time with her. I said, well, Laurie, tell her to meet me backstage. I'll get there about 10 minutes early. They, my schedule was such that it was about all I had. Well, I got there, and I was on uh, backstage behind the curtain on one side. She spotted me from the other side, and as she walked across the stage, I have never seen as much anger in a human being in my life as I saw in her. She almost started crying when she saw me. She said, oh, I'm just so glad to see you. I got this horrible job. I hate it. I hate everything about it. I hate everybody down there. I mean, uh, you're talking about negative nails. She was it. She said, can you help me? Now, understand I've only got about 10 minutes. So I looked at her, and uh, one thing I have learned, I don't do counseling, but I talk with a lot of people who do in psychology, psychiatry, and the ministry. And they tell me that everybody who comes to you with a problem are not necessarily looking for a solution. I couldn't understand that for a long time. Why do they bring you a problem if they don't want to solve it? Well, I can tell you why. They want to tell you about it, you about it, you about it, you about it, and you about it. And if you foul up the deal and solve the problem, they can't tell you again, you again. They want the attention that goes with the problem, and every company just about it has that kind of an individual. They want the attention that goes with griping and, uh, and complaining. Well, I looked at the lady, and it wasn't unkindly, but firmly I said to her, yes, and you know, ma'am, I'm afraid your problem is about to get worse. She said, what do you mean? I said, I believe they're going to fire you. <laughs> She was stunned. I couldn't have stunned her more if I'd hit her in the face with a bucket of ice water. She said, fire me? Why on earth would they fire me? The inflection in her voice clearly said, they're the bad guys. I'm the good guy. Why don't they fire them and keep me? Have you ever noticed that people who are the problem never recognize that they are? They're in complete denial. They think denial is just a river in Egypt. <laughs> Why would they fire me? I said, ma'am, I don't believe there's a company in America big enough to contain this much poison in one small spot. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when somebody is about to lose something they've been complaining about, whether it's a car, a home, a mate, a job, or whatever, when all of a sudden it appears they're going to lose them, it takes on brand new value. She looked at me and said, well, what can I do? I said, do you really want to know? She said, yes, I do. That's the reason I came to see you. I came looking for help, but you sure had not been any help so far. <laughs> I said, well, ma'am, I've got an idea, and I will absolutely guarantee you it positively, definitely, absolutely will work if you will just do it. She said, I'll try anything within reason. I said, okay, when you get home tonight, all of your household tasks are complete. It's bedtime. Get off in a room right by yourself. Get a sheet of paper out, and at the top of it write, I like my job because she interrupted me. She said, that'll be easy. I don't like nothing about that job. Don't like nothing about those people down there. <laughs> and I said, well, just as a matter of curiosity, do you work there for benevolent reasons, or do they pay you for working there? She said, well, I got to confess, they pay me. And I said, and you don't like to be paid. Oh, she said, yes, I do. I said, okay, tell you what you do. Open your notebook right now. We'll start our list of the things you like about your job. They pay you for working there, and you do like it, don't you? She said, absolutely. But she just stood there. I said, no, open your notebook now, and we'll get uh, busy on the list. She just stood there. I said, ma'am, let me, let me tell you what my experience in life has been. I've discovered that in 100% of the cases, no exception, people who won't take Step number one, never take step number two. You see, she had come to me with an impossible dream. 
Her dream was that nice Mr. Ziegler was going to solve all of her problems, and she would live happily ever after. But folks, I got news for you. I can't solve her problems. I can't solve your problems. But I will give you some steps that I'll absolutely, definitely, and positively will work for you, as it worked eventually for her. I said, well, ma'am, let me tell you something. Unless you're willing to take step number one right now, it's been nice talking with you. She angrily opened her notebook. Before we got through, there were 22 things she liked about her job. Not only did they pay her for working there, they paid her above average. She had three weeks vacation with pay. She had a retirement program. She was in on profit sharing. She had health insurance, life insurance, and accident insurance. She lived less than 10 minutes from home. She was in on management decisions. The company sent her to three seminars a year to be paid for. She had her own private office and parking place. 22 things that she liked about her job. Now, I said, ma'am, when you get home tonight, everything is finished. Get off in a room right by yourself. Close the doors. Change one word from I like my job to I love my job. Get in front of that mirror. And folks, I cannot say this strongly enough, but I'm going to try. The eyes are the windows of the soul. Look yourself in the eye and with excitement and enthusiasm say, I love my job because they pay me for working there. I love my job because they pay me above average for working there. I love my job because I have a wonderful insurance program. I love my job before every one of the statements. You will sleep better that night. You see, there's something hidden in what I'm saying to you now. When she says, I like my job, she's really saying, I'm grateful for my job. And of all of the emotions we can have, according to Hans Selye, the number one stress specialist in America, the healthiest of all human emotions is gratitude. I said, you go down that list. I like my job. I love my job, rather. That is a way of gratitude. You'll sleep better the first night. Tomorrow morning, when you get up, get back in front of the mirror just before you go to work, Get back in front of the mirror and repeat the process again with excitement and enthusiasm. I love my job because, and take the list with you. Because the reality is, you see, you will have started to change from a fault finder to a good finder. Some people do really find fault like there's a reward for it. They really do. <laughs> take the list with you and you will be able to add to that list absolutely guaranteed. Do this every morning and every night and you will have an astonishing recovery from this advanced case of stinking thinking. Now, I didn't say that to her, but I'm saying it to you. That's what it was. It was an advanced case of stinking thinking. Well, six weeks later, I was back in Birmingham, Alabama. I was doing a follow-up sales seminar. Now, the lady was not in sales, but she had been listening to my tapes. She had been listening to Automobile University, and she had discovered that everybody sells. Everybody who will ever hear this is in selling. Whether you're a school teacher, a civil service worker, a military personnel, an executive secretary, it doesn't make any difference. What you do, you sell every day of your life. There she was on the, at the sales seminar, seated on the front row, grinning so wide she could have eaten a banana sideways. I'm telling you, <laughs> you're talking about somebody that was excited. She was turned on. I said, well, how you doing? She grinned even more broadly and said, Mr. Ziegler, I'm doing wonderfully well and uh, thank you for asking. She said, you cannot believe how much those people down there have changed. <laughs> I got a lid on the line, folks. You're not going to change anybody else if you change you. Everything really does begin with you. Now, you see, the unfortunate thing, this lady had been raised in a very negative environment. First, her parents had told her that she'd never amount to anything. They said, you know, you're always late, you're always sloppy, why can't you be like your brother or your sister or whatever. When she got married, her husband had continued it, and so her self-talk had become completely negative. Everything that she said about herself was negative. I, you know, like Dad said, I'll never amount to anything. Or like my husband says, I can't do anything right. But when she started changing the input, then some radical changes...
there seems to be a few determining factors for those who overcome. First of all, they've committed themselves, you know, and a commitment uh, prepares you to meet obstacles and downfalls. Because if you've made a commitment to do something and disaster strikes or calamities take place or things don't go your way, you immediately start thinking, how do I solve the problem? If you have no commitments, your first thought is, how do I get out of this deal? And we generally find what we're looking for. And as I laughingly tell people, some people are about as committed as a kamikaze pilot on its 39th mission. Now, whether it's in a marriage or getting your education or achieving a weight loss goal or a sales goal or an academic goal, it doesn't make any difference what it is. Along the way, there's going to be those setbacks and reversals and disappointments. Again, if you've made the commitment, what you do is you continue on. People who've made the commitment, not only and are overcomers, but they also prepare themselves. They expect to win. They prepare to win, and they take the necessary steps in order to get there. This commitment, combined with the persistence and the unshakable belief that eventually they will win, is what separates them. Interestingly enough, most of them, i found, are very humble people. They recognize that they cannot do it themselves. They need help. And that's where faith plays such an incredibly important role in what we do. So when you start adding humility, commitment, persistence, and character. Character is the ability to carry out a good resolution long after the excitement of the moment has passed. Character is what takes them through. I've had so many coaches who teach this philosophy, and Charlie's one of them, who have said that these kids had character. They hung in there. When it looked darkest, they never gave up. That's what overcomers do. They never give up. They keep after it. Let me share with you a, a true story out of my notebook of life. A number of years ago, got an incredible letter from a gentleman in Toronto with a substantial check in it. He said, my friend Steve Walker is following the wrong role model. He's working himself to death. His family is falling apart. Uh, he's, uh, his health is in danger. And he's modeling himself out of his boss. And he trusts you and respects you. If you will give us one hour, I will fly him to Dallas and give you this check. Wouldn't you love to have a friend like that? I sent the check back and I said, come on down. Steve and I had quite a little talk. And in our talk, I asked him why he had such a role model. Why did, what about this man that made him so completely important in his life? And he said, well, he's the most successful man I have ever known. And I said, well, Steve, what do you call success? Now, it took several minutes for him to go down the list. But the interesting thing is, though they're not in the same order that I have put them, or they, we list them now, these are the eight things that he said he really considered to be successful. If a man was happy and healthy and at least reasonably prosperous and secure, if he had friends and peace of mind and good family relationship and the hope that the future is going to be better, he said, I'd consider that man as successful. Now I'm going to really encourage you to take some notes right here. And all I want you to do, and you'll be the only one that'll see it, somewhere right in my, as I go down the list, right whether you get a plus on that one or a minus on that one. You'll be the only one to see it, but it might be an eye opener. You see, most people never dare to evaluate really where they are. And you got to know where you are before you can really determine your chances of getting what you really want out of life. And so I, I said to uh, Steve, I said, I understand that your boss is very important to you. Uh, you consider him to be successful. When he finally got through with the identification, as I said earlier, these were the eight things that he said, I think that's important for success, to measure success. I said, well, Steve, let me ask you now. As far as happy is concerned, uh, tell me, how happy is your boss? He said, oh, I don't think he's happy at all. I said, why not? He said, well, I've never heard him laugh, and he seldom smiles, and besides that, he's got ulcers. 
I said, well, do I give them a plus or a minus? He said, oh, you give them a minus. Please grade yourself as we go. This is so important for you. Then I said, that also tells me something about his health if he's got those ulcers. Do I give him a plus or a minus? He said, you give him a minus. I said, that also says something, uh, uh, Steve, about his peace of mind because you don't get ulcers because of what you eat, but what's eating you. I said, do we give him a plus or a minus? He said, we give him a minus. I said, Steve, I've asked you one question about what success is, what balance is, what's important to you. One question, and your boss comes up with three minuses. I said, tell me how prosperous he is. He said, man, he's got money running out of his ears, and he's getting more every day. I said, we give him a plus on that one, don't we? He said, we sure do. I said, how secure is your boss? He said, well, he's as secure as money can make you. And I said, well, Steve, let me ask you, did you read where two billionaire brothers here in Dallas went bankrupt? I said, how does your boss compare? Oh, man, he doesn't have that kind of money. Did you read where our ex-governor was worth $100 million at one point? He's now bankrupt. How does your boss compare? Oh, he doesn't have that kind of money. Now, understand Steve equated security with corporate position and bucks in the bank. So I said, well, Steve, let me ask you. Would we give your boss a plus or a minus or just a question mark on that? He said, let's be generous and give him a question mark. I said, how many friends does your boss have? I hope you're marking these for you. How many friends, real friends, do you, uh, does your boss have? He said, I don't think he's got any. I'm not his friend. I just happen to admire the guy. I tell you the truth, he's somewhat of a jerk. And I said, okay, we give him a minus on that one. I said, tell me about his family. And he said, well, his wife's divorcing him. Well, that one's easy to answer. I said, how much hope does he have for the future? He said, well, before I started talking to you, I thought he had a lot. <laughs> but right now, I don't think he's got any. Why did that statement come forth? Because for the first time, he had evaluated it. That's what we need to do, evaluate where we are. Are we investing our time properly, using our resources properly? What will the end results be? Well, then I said to uh, Steve, when that was over, we give him the minus there. I said, Steve, of the eight things that you consider marks of success, he gets one, two, three, four, five, six minuses. He gets one plus and one question mark. I asked Steve a question. I'm going to ask you the same question. Steve, would you swap places with your boss right now, knowing what you know? He looked at me kind of stunned. He slowly rose to his feet and said, no, I wouldn't. Would you? Hi, everyone. My name is Blake Lindsay. This is Jill Tibbles. Hi. We certainly want to say welcome to the Inspire Podcast. It's a Ziegler podcast that we do free every single week. And we want you to tell everybody about it because we're excited about this. We're going to do a video podcast at least once a month. Mr. Ziegler is here today, and I'm excited about this. I want to ask you, Mr. Ziegler, why is your faith so important? Uh, that's probably the easiest question anybody will ever ask me. Uh, I was broke and in debt. My career was going nowhere. But on July 4th, 1972, I committed my life to Christ as a result of an elderly black lady spending the weekend in our home. Well, I've always been honest. I've always had character. I don't believe anybody can claim an unpaid debt uh, that I owe them. I've always uh, felt I had good character. God blessed me with a strong voice and, you know, a sense of humor, which is always important. <laughs> uh, but the reality is my career was at a standstill. Uh, literally, when I got an invitation to speak in those years, we had a family celebration. That meant I had a, you know, a payday in front of me. Well, from the day that uh, I found my faith in Christ uh, and started expressing it publicly, uh, my career absolutely exploded. I've not had to solicit a speaking engagement in uh, over 30 years. Mm -hmm. My phone just rings. People are desperately hungry for the truth. My speaker friends have asked me repeatedly, how do you get by with that? I said, well, let me tell you something. Let me explain it to you. Uh, over 90% of the people in America believe there is a God. 
why on earth would I risk offending over 90% of my audience by not talking about what mm -hmm. they believe? Good point. <laughs> Friend, now that is not good marketing. As no, matter sir. of fact, that's <laughs> not marketing at all. So God has blessed that effort. And uh, I have kind of a role model to go by, and that was our founding fathers. Our founding fathers were educated for well over a century in this little book, The New England Primer. Now, in this little book, that's where they got their education. Over 90% of all of the educational thrust was of a religious, moral, ethical nature. By 1950, the percentage was so small you couldn't even measure it. And by 1960, it was anti-God, anti-Christian. Now, all you gotta do is look at the corporate scandals and the government scandals and the violence that's on in our society, the immorality that's on in our society, and you will understand why the Founding Fathers were so insistent on forming public schools so that people could learn how to read so they could read the Bible. Mm. They instinctively knew that God's possibles were infinitely greater than man's permissibles. That's what I discovered in my own career. God's possibles have certainly been better to me than man's permissibles. The Founding Fathers knew that we needed a governing authority. Now, you know, we've kicked God out of just about every place. That is, some people think He's not there, but He's everywhere. You can trust me on that one. Yes. But let me tell you that uh, when you really look at what the teachings have been, it makes a whole lot of difference. And when we look at a governing authority, can you imagine a baseball game without an umpire? Man, not at all. Life, that would be chaos. And so if we trust this governing authority, I tell people, you know, the Supreme Court has ruled that there are certain, uh, uh, you know, places you cannot even display the Ten Commandments. Ironically, if the Supreme Court justices did not obey the Ten Commandments, they would be disrobed, disbarred, and imprisoned. You just kill somebody on the job, even if you're a Supreme Court justice, and see how far you go. You kill somebody in your family, uh, and see how far you'll go. This is a biblical principle I'm talking about. And when you follow biblical principles, chances are dramatically better that you're doing the right thing. So I validate things psychologically, theologically, and physiologically before I verbalize, verbalize them, write about them, or record them because I am confident that the information is correct. It works for everyone in their lives. You know, Zig, one of the things I've appreciated about you through the years is that you've made no secret to the fact that you've had tough times in your life. And I want to know how your faith has played into helping you through those tough times. Well, you know, my Bible it gives me a lot of uh, information along those lines. And uh, I believe one of the little verses that says, this too shall pass. I don't know whether the preacher said that or whether that's in the Bible, but I believe that. We go through cycles. We have our ups and our downs. But when you're down, we need to understand is, and I certainly understand this, that the God of the mountaintop is also the God of the valley. And the good news is that most of us, when we're on the mountaintop, we say, hey, man, I'm doing this good. When we're in the valley, we say, Lord, I need help. And that's where the difference comes in. He yeah. always hears the prayer of a believer. How do you explain to people that occasionally, you know, you, you get a person that says, why did God let that happen? You know, referring <laughs> to the war, the terrorism, or something negative in your life. And how do you explain that? Actually, the explanation of that is uh, very simple. Uh, God did not create us as robots. He created us for a purpose, and that purpose was to worship Him. Yes. And if He had created us and made us have everything just right, what would be His need? And so a loving God put us in a position so that we could grow and mature and have a fulfilled life in every way. And so one of the things that uh, I've really hung to is the Romans 8, 28, which says that all things work together for good to those who love God who are called to serve according to His purpose. Now, that does not say that everything that happens is good. It says God takes our foul-ups, and we have all lots of them, and use those foul-ups to take us up. That's where my faith comes in.
That's very encouraging, and I, I can definitely relate to that. I want to thank everybody again for being here today, and it's, it's a pleasure to interview you, Mr. Ziegler, and, and uh, we're doing this on video once a month. It's a free, inspire podcast. I get inspired every time I get to be the MC, and it's just a big pleasure. So please tell a friend, tell all your family about this, because we are having fun, and Mr. Ziegler is teaching me things that I haven't thought of in a good long time, and I'm glad that I am. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next week. In times of change, the learners shall inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. For over 30 years, I've read an average of three hours a day. Read my Bible every day, read the paper every day. That way I know what both sides are up to. And I just happen to believe that is very, very important. When you start looking at all of these things, when you become a constant student, that's when you, your growth is more substantial. And your motivation and your inspiration and your knowledge. And here's been one of my most interesting discoveries, and I've now written a book on it. It won't be out for quite a little while yet. But how to develop a creative imagination. The more you know about anything, the more creative you become when you add additional information to that. On the book as a manual on how the processes that you follow in sales, only in a book in New York Times, first time in that category that ever reached the bestseller stage. Now, what happened was very important. When I read that book, when I had 98% of it written, somebody sent me a little three, short three-paragraph summation. And what this little three-paragraph said was, this is the heart of the sale. It was three short paragraphs. I read those three paragraphs, and I add, added 50 pages to the book. I'd been selling since I was eight, been sales training since I was 21. I knew a lot about sales. The new information revolutionized a whole lot of things. Keep on growing. It helps a whole lot of people. When you talk about relationships, Harvard Business Class in 1949, almost a little over 49% of all of the graduates, a study was done on them, and this class of 1949, 49% of them were at least vice presidents in major corporations. When asked how do they accounted for that, and CNN did a, a telecast on these men, uh, they said, well, number one, our wives were supportive. Their careers were built on integrity. They were risk takers, but they did not, uh, where they were not gamblers. What do we do at our company? How many of the things do we teach and what do I teach that are so important to me as I'm talking about it now? Our mission statement includes a big frying pan to be the difference maker in the personal, family, professional, and spiritual lives of enough people to make a positive difference in the world. That's a pretty audacious mission statement, ladies and gentlemen, but it's got to be built on character. Are we being successful in that? Well, over 40 languages of what I've been teaching have been reprinted uh, printed and used. We've got several, several inform uh, information bits that really, really have made a difference in the lives of other people. In short, with 40 translations of our work in different languages, we're reaching an awful lot of people. Now, we teach things that are generally not taught in school, as I already have said, but I want to talk about another little factor. 90% of the visits to medical doctors are directly or indirectly related to stress. 90%. If we can reduce stress, and incidentally, the same process that reduces stress is exactly the same process that will enable you to have a long-term balanced career. My stress level, and I face as many deadlines as anybody you know. It's always a book production, a class I'm teaching, a seminar I'm presenting, and each one of them uh, requires time and concentration. Example, how many of you feel like I've made this talk before? Can I see your hand, please? Several hundred times I made it yesterday. You know what I did between yesterday and today? I spent over six hours getting ready for today. 
You see, I think it would be arrogant if I thought I could stand up and spit it out just because I did it yesterday or hundreds of times. That's arrogance. That's when Buster Douglas knocks out Mike Tyson. That's when an expansion team in Houston beats an established NFL team in Dallas. I dare not. Look at the people here, several thousand. I'm taking over an hour. That's several thousand hours of time. Where would my integrity be if I came here unprepared to make something, a presentation that could make a difference in your life? There is no way. you got to prepare for it, ladies and gentlemen. When stress does hit you, how many of you will admit that after 9-11, maybe you had a little stress? Can I see your hands, please? All right. Let me tell you something, folks. If you take the word stressed and spell it backwards, it's desserts. When you respond to life instead of react to it, React is negative. You get sick, go to the doctor. She gives you a prescription, says, see me tomorrow. You walk in the next day, she said, "Uh uh-oh, it's not working. Uh, We have to change their prescription. You get a little nervous. But if she smiled and said, hey, it's working. And so you have just, she's just responded. And you feel better because now you see some real hope in order to get ahead in life. But I don't care how optimistic you are. And incidentally, for what it's worth, I am an optimist. Uh, I'd take my last $2 and buy a money belt with it. I mean, that's the way I'm put together. I'd go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with me. Your optimism is an important fact of life. By yourself, close the doors, change one word from I like my job to I love my job. Get in front of that mirror. And folks, I cannot say this strongly enough, but I'm going to try. The eyes are the windows of the soul. Look yourself in the eye and with excitement and enthusiasm, say, I love my job because they pay me for working there. I love my job because they pay me above average for working there. I love my job because I have a wonderful insurance program. I love my job before every one of the statements. You will sleep better that night. You see, there's something hidden in what I'm saying to you now. When she says, I like my job, she's really saying, I'm grateful for my job. And of all of the emotions we can have, according to Hans Selye, the number one stress specialist in America, the healthiest of all human emotions is gratitude. I said, you go down that list. I like my job. I love my job, rather. That is a way of gratitude. You'll sleep better the first night. Tomorrow morning, when you get up, Get back in front of the mirror just before you go to work. Get back in front of the mirror and repeat the process again with excitement and enthusiasm. I love my job because, and take the list with you. Because the reality is, you see, you will have started to change from a fault finder to a good finder. Some people do really find fault like there's a reward for it. They really do. (laughs) Take the list with you, and you will be able to add to that list absolutely guaranteed. Do this every morning and every night, and you will have an astonishing recovery from this advanced case of stinking thinking. Now, I didn't say that to her, but I'm saying it to you. That's what it was. It was an advanced case of stinking thinking. Well, six weeks later, I was back in Birmingham, Alabama. I was doing a follow-up sales seminar. Now, the lady was not, she interrupted me. She said, that'll be easy. I don't like nothing about that job. Don't like nothing about those people down there. And I said, well, just as a matter of curiosity, do you work there for benevolent reasons or do they pay you for working there? She said, well, I got to confess, they pay me. And I said, and you don't like to be paid. Oh, she said, yes, I do. I said, okay, tell you what you do. Open your notebook right now. We'll start our list of the things you like about your job. They pay you for working there, and you do like it, don't you? She said, absolutely. But she just stood there. I said, no, open your notebook now, and we'll get uh, busy on the list. She just stood there. I said, ma'am, let me, let me tell you what my experience in life has been. I've discovered that in 100% of the cases, no exception, people who won't take step number one never take step number two. You see, she had come to me with an impossible dream. Her dream was that nice Mr. Ziegler was going to solve all of her problems, and she would live happily ever after. But folks, I got news for you. I can't solve her problems. 
I can't solve your problems. But I will give you some steps that I absolutely, definitely, and positively will work for you, as it worked eventually for her. I said, well, ma'am, let me tell you something. Unless you're willing to take step number one right now, it's been nice talking with you. She angrily opened her notebook. Before we got through, there were 22 things she liked about her job. Not only did they pay her for working there, they paid her above average. She had three weeks vacation with pay. She had a retirement program. She was in on profit sharing. She had health insurance, life insurance, and accident insurance. She lived less than 10 minutes from home. She was in on management decisions. The company sent her to three seminars a year to be paid for. She had her own private office and parking place. 22 things that she liked about her job. Now I said, ma'am, when you get home tonight, everything is finished. Get off in a room right by. When you're asleep, ladies and gentlemen, you need your dreams. I'm here to tell you that when you're wide awake, you also need your dreams. You must have your goals. You'll never make it as a wandering generality. You must become a meaningful specific. If you're going to work tomorrow because that's what you did yesterday, you're not going to be as good tomorrow as you were yesterday because now you're two days older and no closer to the goal which you do not have. You can't make it as a wandering generality. A number of years ago, Larry Majors, my executive assistant, got a phone call from a lady in Birmingham, Alabama. At the end of the conversation, she said, Zig, she said, I believe this woman thinks she's got an impossible problem, but I believe you can solve that problem her, with her in just a few minutes if you will spend that time with her. I said, well, Larry, tell her to meet me backstage. I'll get there about 10 minutes early. They, my schedule was such that it was about all I had. Well, I got there, and I was on uh, backstage behind the curtain on one side. She spotted me from the other side, and as she walked across the stage, I have never seen as much anger in a human being in my life as I saw in her. She almost started crying when she saw me. She said, oh, I'm just so glad to see you. I got this horrible job. I hate it. I hate everything about it. I hate everybody down there. I mean, uh, you're talking about negative nails. She was it. She said, can you help me? Now, understand I've only got about 10 minutes. So I looked at her, and uh, one thing I have learned, I don't do counseling, but I talk with a lot of people who do in psychology, psychiatry, and the ministry. And they tell me that everybody who comes to you with a problem are not necessarily looking for a solution. I couldn't understand that for a long time. Why do they bring you a problem if they don't want to solve it? Well, I can tell you why. They want to tell you in sales. But she had been listening to my tapes. She had been listening to Automobile University. And she had discovered that everybody sells. Everybody who will ever hear this is in selling. Whether you're a school teacher, a civil service worker, a military personnel, an executive secretary, it doesn't make any difference what you do. You sell every day of your life. There she was on the, at the sales seminar, seated on the front row, grinning so wide she could have eaten a banana sideways. I'm telling you, <laughs> you're talking about somebody that was excited. She was turned on. I said, well, how you doing? She grinned even more broadly and said, Mr. Ziegler, I'm doing wonderfully well, and uh, thank you for asking. She said, you cannot believe how much those people down there have changed. <laughs> I got a lid on the line, folks. You're not going to change anybody else till you change you. Everything really does begin with you. Now, you see, the unfortunate thing, this lady had been raised in a very negative environment. First, her parents had told her that she'd never amount to anything. They said, you know, you're always late. You're always sloppy. Why can't you be like your brother or your sister or whatever? When she got married, her husband had continued it. And so her self-talk had become completely negative. Everything that she said about herself was negative. I, you know, like Dad said, I'll never amount to anything. Or like my husband says, I can't do anything right. But when she started changing the input, then some radical changes. There seems to be a few determining factors for those who overcome. First of all, they've committed themselves, you know, and 
uh, commitment uh, prepares you to meet obstacles and downfalls. Because if you've made a commitment... Well, you about it, you about it, you about it, you about it, and you about it, and if you foul up the deal and solve the problem, they can't tell you again, you again. They want the attention that goes with the problem, and every company just about it has that kind of an individual. They want the attention that goes with griping and, uh, and complaining. Well, I looked at the lady, and it wasn't unkindly, but firmly I said to her, yes, and you know, ma'am, I'm afraid your problem is about to get worse. She said, what do you mean? I said, I believe they're going to fire you. <laughs> She was stunned. I couldn't have stunned her more if I'd hit her in the face with a bucket of ice water. She said, fire me? Why on earth would they fire me? The inflection in her voice clearly said, they're the bad guys. I'm the good guy. Why don't they fire them and keep me? Have you ever noticed that people who are the problem never recognize that they are? They're in complete denial. They think denial is just a river in Egypt. <laughs> Why would they fire me? I said, ma'am, I don't believe there's a company in America big enough to contain this much poison in one small spot. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when somebody is about to lose something they've been complaining about, whether it's a car, a home, a mate, a job, or whatever, when all of a sudden it appears they're going to lose them, it takes on brand new value. She looked at me and said, well, what can I do? I said, do you really want to know? She said, yes, I do. That's the reason I came to see you. I came looking for help, but you sure haven't been any help so far. <laughs> I said, well, ma'am, I've got an idea, and I will absolutely guarantee you it positively, definitely, absolutely will work if you will just do it. She said, I'll try anything within reason. I said, okay, when you get home tonight, all of your household tasks are complete. It's bedtime. Get off in a room right by yourself. Get a sheet of paper out, and at the top of it write, I like my job because...